first place, uh, when it comes to the uh, Bible and the Quran, I think it's very important that you have to take them on their own terms and not to assume that everything that goes uh, under the name of a religious text can be understood uh, as in the same way that every other religious text can be understood. They all have their different, they're all sort of a different universe, each one. And when it comes to laws about stoning and so on that's in Leviticus, uh, when it comes to that, for Jews, everything changed with the destruction of the temple because everything, all those ritual laws centered around the uh, temple worship. And when the temple worship was no longer possible, then those laws had to be comprehensively reevaluated, and they were by the rabbis. And in the rabbinic tradition, the, uh, they were not considered to be uh, lawful to be carried out and were understood in a different way. In the Christian tradition, something of a similar nature happened for very different reasons. For example, when you come again to stoning, you have uh, Jesus saying the famous thing in uh, John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11, the story about the woman taken in adultery, and he says, let he who is who's without sin cast the first stone. And so because Jesus is considered in the Christian tradition to be the Messiah who fulfills the law, fulfilling the law has always been understood by all the Christian traditions as being something that in, in practice essentially means that a lot of those ritual laws of, the, of Leviticus and the rest of the, of the Torah are set aside and have never been practiced by Christians. You know, only on TV do Christians stone anybody. They don't really ever have done it. and They, they have never really done it in history. Now... The uh, Quran has to be understood in light of the Hadith, the traditions of Muhammad, and Islamic jurisprudence. And the traditions of Muhammad, he practiced stoning. Actually, stoning is not in the Quran. But there is a very, very famous tradition, very interesting tradition on many levels, uh, of the Caliph Umar, who was Muhammad's second successor after he died as the leader of the Muslim community. And he says that stoning is not in the Quran, but it was. He doesn't explain how it is that it dropped out, but he just says that it was. And we know that, that there were people who had memorized parts of the Quran who were killed during the wars of apostasy right after Muhammad died in 632 to 634. And so some parts of it were lost. Umar also says, as a matter of fact, some people say they memorized the whole Quran. No one can say that because nobody has the whole Quran. In any case, in the one that I'm telling you about, he says there was... Stoning for adultery in the Quran, it is no longer there. But he doesn't want people of future generations to say that because stoning is not in the Quran, it should not be done. Muhammad practiced stoning, and it is part of the law of God. And there are also other traditions in which Muhammad does practice stoning, and uh, even challenges the Jews about the fact that it is in the Torah, and they are not practicing it. And so... This makes it very difficult for Islamic jurisprudence to formulate any kind of understanding of what the penalty for adultery ought to be without stoning, since Muhammad's words and deeds are normative. And those, those traditions are considered to be authentic hadith. They're in Bukhari, the uh, hadith collection that is considered most reliable by Muslims. Now, is it possible that you can have uh, a formulation of Islam that is different from that? Well, I suppose anything is possible theoretically. I'll give you a little, a little example. Tariq Ramadan is a very well-known Islamic reformer. He's actually been called the Muslim Martin Luther. And uh, he has written many important books, including To Be a European Muslim, and so on. And he's actually uh, just uh, come to the United States, and I expect he's going to be here a long time, and we'll be hearing quite a bit from him. And he called for, recently, I'm talking a few years back, a moratorium on stoning in Muslim countries, on stoning for adultery, which, you know, there are eight women right now on death row in Iran, ready to be stoned to death, and it's practiced in Somalia, in Saudi Arabia, and in Iran. And so he called for a moratorium on it, and he was actually challenged on this, and some people asked him, well, are you saying that there should be no stoning, it should, be, it should stop, that there should never be stoning? in the context of Islamic law, and he wouldn't say that. He couldn't, he felt, he said, you know, I have to, I am bound by what's in the Quran and the Sunnah. And so this is a reformer speaking. This is one of the most prominent reformers in the world. He stopped short of saying that stoning should be scrapped altogether. 
Now, of course, there's a multiplicity of opinion. I'm sure you can find many uh, Muslims, particularly in the West, who will say that that should not be done or should not be done now. Uh, unfortunately, however, the, the, the schools of jurisprudence, the Madhadhib, the ones that I mentioned, the Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi, and Hanbali schools, and the Jafaris among the Shiites, uh, do have a certain influence in the Islamic world to this day. And they have not made any significant moves to uh, reform these kinds of teachings. So, you're, you're, you know, I understand that coming from the outside uh, of studying this, and you hear me quote this one and quote that one, and it sounds like, well, you're just quoting a couple of guys, and I can find ten guys who will say the opposite. Well, that's great. Go ahead. I, I wish you all the luck in that, and I hope you do well. I'm looking for them, too. Uh, the problem is that the ones that you will find who actually oppose the laws of jihad uh, in particular, you will find um, do not represent authoritative or mainstream uh, views within Islam and don't have significant followings in the Islamic world. The reasons why Muslims are not waging jihad on a large scale, uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. Most people, for example, can't be bothered. You know, most Christians can't be bothered. Most Jews can't be bothered. Most people are not that religious. You know, most people, because they hold to religion, it doesn't mean that everything that they do in their lives is all about the religion. They want to have a job. They want to have a family. They want to live a life. They're not going to go and throw everything over and go kill themselves somewhere. Um, there are people who will, obviously. There are people who do. At the same time, there are a huge number of reasons why this is not happening on a large scale, but I would suggest to you that it is happening on probably a larger scale than you may realize, and invite you to investigate that. And insofar as reformist scholars go, I'm all for them, insofar as they are sincere, and I wish them all the luck, uh, but we're kidding ourselves if we think that they have large followings among Muslims worldwide. May I ask a very brief follow-up? Yeah. You, want, you, you mentioned that, uh, that the vast majority of, of, of adherents to Muslim, to, to Islam, don't, uh, don't, can't be bothered, as you said, to, to wage global jihad. And if, if to the extent that Islam represents a full life uh, tradition, a, a, a religion which encapsulates one's whole life, wouldn't that represent some type of spiritualization and bringing those specific texts that you mentioned <clears throat> into a more contemporary way of life? Isn't that, isn't that actually evidence of a spiritualization? Or no, modernization? because it's not theologically based. It's, a, it's an abandonment of... It's a, it's, a, it's a rejection, not a rejection really, it's just sort of ignoring it. Look, it's just like, uh, uh, it's just like this, like this. Uh, in the Catholic Church, contraception is forbidden. But most Catholics, like 75, 80%, maybe more, contracept. Does that mean that the Catholic Church does not teach contraception, or that the law is going to be changed, or that it represents some kind of an intellectual development within Catholicism? No, none of the above. They just can't be bothered. It's not, a, it's not that they are coming to some sort of a uh, viable alternative perspective on these issues. It's just inconvenient. It's just that some people are just not as committed to their religion as other people are. That's all. Yes, you've been very patient. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, but uh, I, I still don't know that, that your response to, to Truman's question fully addressed um, why... One point, what was it, 1.5 billion? Yeah, the uh, numbers I'm, differ. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. actually, let me finish my question. Oh, um, sure. The, the problem I have is when, as I, and I'm sorry, I don't know his name, the gentleman earlier uh, spoke of Christianity being used to uh, justify anti miscegenation <laughs> laws, being used at multiple points to justify slavery, as well as um, religious wars, bombing oh, of yeah. adoption clinics. Yeah. And you. You write those individuals off as crazy or stupid or lazy in their religion, yeah. yet an isolated and still relatively small compared to the number of Muslims who practice their faith peacefully are bound by dictates of something that in your construction is an inherently violent law. So it's just it's fascinating to me. Would you like to explain how those people who would use Christianity for something negative um, are stupid or lazy in their religion or um, 